Uh, good question. Yes, indeed, I did write a book, nearly finished. I need to write the intro and the conclusion yet. I'm interested in the triangular exchange among physicists and physiologists and later engineers on the one hand, uh, composers and musicians on the other hand, and a third hand, uh, musical instrument makers from the late 18th century to basically the 1960s. So, for example, Wilhelm Weber, the famous German uh, physicist, helped improve organ pipes so that you could increase the volume of an organ without changing the pitch, which is an important moment in, in musical history as well as in physics. Uh, Charles Wheatstone, the British uh, instrument maker, famous actually for his work in electricity and physics, invented the concertina. Um, so I'm interested in, the, in, in that exchange. Also, uh, the famous flautist Böhm uh, and his improvements on the flute, which are now, his flute is, is world-renowned, and how he worked with acousticians in the 19th century to do that. Um, also, why is it that A uh, for, is 440, concert pitch? Why is it not 435? And it turns out it was 435. It's nothing magical about 440. There's a great history in the 19th and 20th centuries of various countries, very nationalistic and also economic issues at stake for fixed tone instruments, battling each other on what A should be. And it became 440 in the 20th century because the important of radio transmission. We needed the sharper pitch to make radio transmissions um, more attractive. And the, the argument also was in Britain, if you had a different standard from Germany and France, they listened to radio stations from these countries. It's, it has a different tonal color, so that had changed. And also the role of radio to the development of, elect of electric musical instruments, such as the trautonium, such as the theremin, how that changed the musical aesthetics. Trautonium and theremin were... Um, were physicists and engineers in the early 20th century. And then I end with the rise after World War II of electronic music studios in Cologne, in Paris, in New York, in Tokyo, in East Berlin, um, and how physicists and engineers, particularly sound re uh, engineers, uh, work together to achieve a new aesthetic with composers such as famously Cage, Varese, Chavez, uh, Ligeti, and of course in Germany, Stockhausen. Um, one never writes the book one thinks one's going to write, uh, which is a good thing, I think. So coming to Berlin this year, I was able to look at a lot of archives and was surprised to see the various directions the book would go. You always have to follow the archive as a historian. Um, so I was able to research the importance of physiology, physiologists, the way that physiologists from the 19th and the 20th century studied pianists and violinists in order to standardize body posture and correct playing technique that was then taught at conservatoires. So physiologists actually have a role, and neurophysiologists, in explaining uh, touch, for example. Um, so the archives were important, but also talking to fellows uh, was very important. And the classic example would be Abers Posadas, who is the composer in residence here. He uses uh, technology uh, for his compositions. I spoke to him at length about how he uses technology as a tool in his compositions and compared that with him with uh, of the composers which he had, for whom he had great respect, such as Varese, such as Chavez, to see how it is that uh, composers today still use the techniques provided by engineers and physicists. I mean, the most famous one, I'm a historian of science for all of my sins, which there were many. The, the classic text that everyone quotes, and it was incredibly influential, is Thomas Kuhn's Structure of the Scientific Revolutions, which dates before, <laughs> before I was born in 1962. Uh, I think everyone should read that, but uh, I think more recently, even though it's now uh, <laughs> on the scale of about 30 years, uh, Leviathan and the Air Pump, uh, which was co-authored by uh, Stephen Shapin and Simon Schaffer that gives a historical detail of the fight between the philosopher Thomas Hobbes and the uh, experimental natural philosopher Robert Boyle on the status of experiment to proper knowledge in, in, in science. And I think they, they argued rather compellingly that solutions to the question of the uh, natural order were simultaneously solutions to the questions of sociopolitical order. And I think that influenced a, a group of my generation. I think that would be the one I would recommend to, uh, to historians of science, but to a general audience as well to see how it is that science is indeed a part of culture. I'd like to have another sabbatical so that I could read all of the works of my colleagues. Uh, but if I had to choose, and it was tricky to choose, I guess uh, I'd have to say Carrie Harrison's Richard's Foot. I think I've heard wonderful things about that. And after talking to Carrie about notions of agency in his books, right? And agency is something that historians of science are interested in as well. I'd love to read that as well as some of his radio plays. A Breakfast with Stalin just sounds amazing. As he also wrote one on Newton, which would, of course, be interesting to me. And also the, the, the upcoming work of Frederick Brenner, who 
who's writing a, who's, who's a, who's a, who's a book of compositions of, of photographs of leaves. I love autumn leaves. I remember my first encounters with Frederick Jadvico was literally he's on the street taking pictures of leaves. I was worried he was going to be hit by a car. And that ensued into an, a really wonderful discussion about how it is a photographer, an artist, looks at contrast of objects. And I, being an historian of science, talk about how famous people looked at archetypal designs, just Goethe's Urpflanze, so right, and the archetypal leaf. Um, so I will look forward to when that book comes out. I'll definitely look at that as well.